Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, the true crime podcast from three friends sharing their perspectives from having years of 911 dispatch experience. Episode 29. Why doesn't she leave? In honor of October being Domestic Violence Awareness Month, this week's episode focuses on the misconceptions and stigmas surrounding domestic violence in America. We'll start with the case of Marie Varsos. So October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I know we've shared stories about the dangers of domestic violence before in the Gabby Petito and Susan Cox Powell episodes, but I wanted to start the month with a story of domestic violence. So my question for today is how many times have you heard the question, why doesn't she just leave? Like in dispatch. Or in general. Well, I was going to say, in dispatch, almost every day, right, people don't realize that it's harder than they think. So all the time in dispatch. And I think any time, granted, being in not dispatch, domestic violence comes up less regularly than when it did when I worked in a center. That's good. Yeah, right? (laughs) (laughs) But in the event that it does come up, unless people are familiar with it, there's always that comment of why don't they just leave or like why there's do they a hang misunderstanding around? yeah i think there's a lot more visibility to what that actually looks like now but i still think that's something that people don't quite grasp the full unless the they've full been there right of. have been there or have an insight to it yeah today's story is pretty recent but I thought it was like a good one to share. And it doesn't have like a bunch of crazy details, but I wanted to use this episode to kind of share some insight into domestic violence for that reason, right? Because not everybody goes through domestic violence or maybe not everybody knows when they're in a domestic violence situation either. So right. I think there is that misunderstanding, especially if you're a first responder, why doesn't she leave? Which it shouldn't be that way, right? Mm-hmm. So... April 12th, 2021, 31-year-old Marie Varsos, I don't know how to say that, and her mother, 60-year-old Deborah Sisko, were murdered by Marie's estranged husband, Sean Varsos. He had gone to Deborah's house to, and this is a quote, confront Marie as she left for work. Marie fought against Sean, shot him three times while she shouted to the neighbors to stay inside. So she was carrying a gun and she shot him when he was attacking her. Sean would then flee in a Nissan SUV and end up taking his own life, and in his vehicle, law enforcement would find zip ties, battery acid, and guns. Maria's brother would later tell the media, I know that people may sort of say, well, did she have a gun? Was she trained? Alex, that's his name, also said she did and she was, and that still did not save her. I feel like that statement is pretty important. Because when you ask that question of why doesn't she leave, do you, like I don't think people quite understand how dangerous that is right and even if they have protection even if they're trained even if they know all the things to do to protect themselves it doesn't mean that they're gonna make it out alive right exactly minutes before he murdered his wife and mother-in-law he posted on facebook saying and this is a quote marie killed me she lied to me and destroyed me this is my dying declaration he went on to write that he couldn't live with the mental abuse any longer So here's a little backstory about what led up to this incident, right? Marie and Sean were married in May of 2013, and they separated in January of 2021. On March 3rd, 2021, she filed for divorce and cited irreconcilable differences and inappropriate marital conduct. Three days after Marie had filed for divorce, Marie went to the couple's home to get some of her belongings, and when Marie tried to leave, Sean grabbed her, picked her up, and placed her on the front porch. He then attempted to strangle her. She passed out, and when she regained consciousness, she saw him take her phone and her keys. He then grabbed a gun and threatened to kill her. He hit her in the face, pointed the gun at her, and then put the gun in his mouth and threatened to end his own life. Marie was held hostage for about an hour until Marie's mom came, and that kind of, like, calmed things down. Mm. And they attempted to get an order of protection and call the police And she stated she was afraid for her life and that she thought her husband would kill her, her family, and himself. And on March 11th, which was days after that, Sean was arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and was set to be in criminal court July of 2021. 
So Marie had done everything she could as a domestic violence victim. She filed a police report. She applied for an order of protection. She told police she was afraid that he would kill her and her family and that he had a gun and he was willing to use it. Through his bond agreement and the order of protection, Sean was ordered not to have access to guns, but no one oversaw making sure that he surrendered his guns. He said he was going to give his guns to his father, but there's no documentation that that actually occurred. When Alex, Marie's brother, and Deborah's son flew to Nashville to plan the funerals and settle estates, he gained access to her laptop. Marie had been documenting her abuse and her efforts to escape her husband. Marie had also kept recordings of some of the abuse on her computer, and in one of them, she can be heard saying, stop, please don't put your hands on me, before Sean put his hands around her neck and choked her until she passed out. Wow. So she had documented the abuse. According to Alex, when his mother and Marie tried to get help from law enforcement after Marie fled from the assault, they were told, and this is a quote, they're working on getting out to you. There's just nobody in the precinct right now. And this is the dispatcher that's saying this. So what's going to happen is a patrol car is going to have to free up from whatever they're doing to come. But they do have to take those life-threatening emergencies first. We've heard that before, too. Yep. Apparently, Alex made calls to dispatch as well, and he was saying stuff like, I'm trying to be as appreciative and waiting as long as possible, but my sister was choked until she passed out, and her husband threatened to shoot her and threatened to shoot himself, so my patience is gone, which I don't blame yeah. him. I I feel like that's life-threatening to me. I mean, I know she escaped it, but where is he now? What is he doing? Where is she? Like, yeah. We, again, we just talked about this, right? Like, we can't take those threats idly at least so and when I say we and when I talk about things like that from my own personal experience working in the center that we worked in that would be a high priority call because a toner. the threat to life yeah that would be send so it doesn't matter if they're working on a non-injury accident or they're taking their lower priority call that comes out they stop what they're doing and they go handle the life and death stuff first because mm-hmm. The threat, the threat to life, the threat to re- somebody else's or their own, right? Mm-hmm. That That's that high priority, at least for us. <laughs> and it should be. I feel I like we've said every center has their own policy, but it should be, especially y- hope, when yeah. she's <laughs> held hostage and choked out. I will mm-hmm. say that ever since that Susan Cox Powell episode, Like, I had heard the story, and I thought it was mind-blowing, and it was crazy, especially as a dispatcher. But ever since that episode, I have been careful to say life-threatening emergencies, unless I know for a fact that that person... So, like, say that person's calling in because they got into an accident in a parking lot, and they're both cooperative and just waiting, and they're just both frustrated. Then I might use that, oh, well, they have to respond to these more life-threatening emergencies first, and then they'll get to you when they can. Mm -hmm. We'll send someone when we can. But especially in these kinds of situations, I would just, I'm just more careful about what I say. Well, especially when there's that like higher stress level. We as, as regular people, let alone as emergency dispatchers, we don't know where that threshold is before somebody snaps. Yeah. So if, and that's why, while a verbal argument may not be a toner, it depends on the circumstances because if parties are separated and like there are others on scene to help keep things calm, maybe they're strangers or something like that, there's a less likely probability of that turning into a physical altercation. Mm-hmm. But when there's the relationship stressors, so family or significant others, anything like that, there's that higher stress level that means that things can escalate more quickly. So a lot of times, at least in our center, again, when it was verbal disturbances, they would go in as domestic violence calls regardless because there is such a high possibility that they'll flip so quickly. And those seconds matter. We got to we got to get somebody on scene to help relegate things before things escalate. Yep. That was always my mentality. Those situations are just too unpredictable. Like you said, Mm -hmm. it can go from a verbal argument to a stab. I mean, honestly, like a stabbing or a beating or anything really in seconds because you -hmm. you don't know how heated they're getting. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. So it wasn't until hours later until they actually got law enforcement to respond. And Sean wasn't served with the order of protection until he went in to pick it up from the police station the next day. 
So they like called him in. This is according to all of my references, like all of my, all of the research I did. And I'll state those at the end. But they called him in and he was served the order of protection. At that time, a warrant had also been issued for his arrest, but somehow they missed that. And he walked out of the sheriff's office and wasn't arrested until days later when Marie told him where he was. So I feel like they made quite a few mistakes in this instance. I don't know if they didn't run him or it just seems weird to me because it seems like, right, if they called him and knew about his order of protection, why didn't they know about his warrant too? See, this is what it was just weird to me because at our center, I feel like they always have a plan for when they're going to arrest someone or like, you know what I mean? Why didn't they run him if they had contact with him? Maybe their civil department is completely separate and they're not aware of the call for services that happened so yeah, they don't know. Or maybe they hadn't but... even entered it into the system because it was the next day. Who knows? Yeah. So Metro Nashville Police Captain Kevin Lovell would later tell Alex that the response time was completely unacceptable and that they had changed the way they categorize all DV calls so their response time would be better. So, I mean, at least there's that's good. one good thing that would come from that, right? Yeah. Marie's attorney at Miller Upshaw Family Law offered the following statement, and this is a quote. We are devastated that the ex parte order of protection that our client, Marie, obtained on March 8, 2021, which was in effect at the time of her death, was not enough to keep her and her mother, Deborah Sisko, from being the latest victims of domestic violence against women in Tennessee. Their deaths will serve as a grim reminder that an order of protection alone is not the solution to the problem of domestic violence, and we hope this tragedy will result in a renewed effort on the part of our lawmakers to address the systemic issues related to the protection of domestic assault victims and the prosecution of their abusers. And that's the tricky thing with getting those order of protections. Like, it is. It's just... It's just a piece of paper that says that they're not allowed to do something that can help if responders get there in time. Yeah. And also, they've already proven they don't care about the law. You think they're going to care about this piece of paper when they didn't care if they strangled that person before, knowing that it was wrong, probably? Like, those type of abusers don't care about the law. It's not going to stop them from trying. I mean, maybe sometimes it will be. Sometimes it's a wake up call for people, right? Who maybe they are stuck in this cycle and it's like, oh man, I really need to change because I'm going to mess up my life. But most of the time, it's really not. Sadly, it seems that the system failed Marie in this situation multiple ways, right? The response time, not serving his warrant, everything kind of piled on together. He didn't turn over his guns. Nobody oversaw that. So I I wanted to share this story specifically, like I know there's not a lot of details because it did just happen in in these kind of situations when the suspect takes their own life, there's not a lot of investigating into what led to this, which is sad. But I wanted to share it because domestic violence is such an issue in the United States and to let domestic violence survivors know that they're not alone and that there is help available, but also bring to light some of the, the red flags that were missed in this case. So every October I go and I speak at a pregnancy program about domestic violence. So I've done a lot of research on it. So I kind of wanted to share some red flags that, you know, maybe you need someone listening or maybe your friend needs and you'll be able to help them. So strangulation is a huge indicator that domestic violence will turn fatal and so are threats with a gun. And I believe it's like seven times more likely that they will murder you if they strangle you somewhere in there. Uh, According to Joni E. Johnson, a psychologist, this is a quote, batterers who strangle their victims are more likely to engage in other extreme acts of violence. It's a message that there are no limits to which he won't go, he or she. The odds are he's willing to kill or she. I'm adding the she because men can be domestic violence victims too. In an article for Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, a 2008 study from the Journal of Emergency Medicine was cited and found that 43% of women who were murdered in domestic assaults and 45% of the victims of attempted murder had been strangled by their partner within the year before. The National Domestic Violence Hotline website defines strangulation as the most deadly form of domestic violence. The victim loses consciousness within seconds and death can occur within minutes. If the victim survives, the odds of the abuser strangling the victim again, oh, here we go, is 10 times higher. And if the victim survives, non-deadly strangulation effects are permanent. 
So it can cause permanent brain damage, PTSD. Yeah. A couple startling statistics per the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and I'm just going to read a couple off, um, just things to think about when you're asking again, why does she stay? An average of 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. This equates to more than 10 million women and men in the U.S. One in four women and one in nine men experience some form of domestic violence. One in 10 women have been raped by an intimate partner. One in seven women and one in 18 men have been victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Can I, I'm going to interrupt here because I, I think it's something we've touched on it and you even mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I think it's really important to shed light on is that these statistics include men because it does also happen to them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the likelihood that those statistics are higher in real life is very probable because it's not reported, right? Because yep. S society already is struggling with toxic masculinity and don't show emotion and all i want that's, preach again. sister <laughs> preach <laughs> but that's such a disservice to victims across the board mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter your gender it doesn't matter your sexual orientation none of it matters if you are a victim of something that should not be taken away from you regardless of whatever status you fall under Yep. If something as bad is happening to you, nobody else should be able to take that away from you. Nobody else should be able to tell you like, oh, well, you're a man. Just man up. Like, don't let her push you around. That's some fucking bullshit. Amen. And if Amen. somebody tells you and if somebody tells you that out loud there, listener, you tell me and I'll go. Find and Jess has and your back. She has your back. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's like a really good point and why I kind of brought it up a little bit is because so I'm going to share a little story as you guys know my fiance is a police officer and he has responded to domestic violence calls where men were also abused by their partner and women can be just as mean and just as oh, dangerous yeah. as men against men mm -hmm. like you said it doesn't matter if you're a man it doesn't matter if you're rich it doesn't matter if you're poor it doesn't matter if you're a woman it doesn't matter what job you have it doesn't matter how smart you are you can still mm -hmm. be a victim of domestic violence and you shouldn't feel shame in that you shouldn't feel shame in yes. making report you deserve help love should not it should not be dangerous right you should not wake up every day and be scared of your partner, no matter who you are. And these are just violent domestic abuse statistics and stuff. Domestic abuse can take all kinds of shapes and forms, right? The person can threaten mm -hmm. you. They can intimidate you. They can call you names. They can make you feel smaller than you actually are. They can withhold money from you. You could have just one car and they monitor where you go. They track all your social media. There's so many different things that are considered domestic violence, right? So many different red flags. And if you feel like you maybe are in a domestic violence situation, do some research. There's tons of research out there. There's this thing called the Wheel of Power, which I will also post on our social media and it goes over the many different kinds and examples of domestic violence. And I'm not saying like you have to leave if one of those things are true, right? I can't put that on you. Nobody can. That's your decision to make. People do not leave until they are ready to leave. But if you're more aware of that, maybe you and your partner can make some changes and you can be like, hey, this isn't healthy. Let's make our relationship more healthy. Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can leave and sometimes you cannot leave because it's too dangerous to leave, right? Because the most dangerous time for a victim is when they are leaving because that abuser has lost all that control and they just kind of, they kind of lose it. So I think it's important to point that out. Like there are many different forms of domestic violence. It's not just he hits me or she hits me. This one's scary, but important. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Yeah. And 19% of DV situations involve a weapon. So going back to Marie's story, he had access to guns. Nobody made sure he turned those guns over. 
he and Marie had been shooting together. So they both were trained. But I don't think she was, I think she probably was expecting to be a little bit safer, right? You think that if you go get this order of protection and they say they're going to take his guns, that they're actually going to see it through. It wouldn't be a hope that you would have. It'd be an expectation. Right. And I think everyone would have that expectation. DV is correlated with a higher rate of depression and suicidal ideation. So it not only affects their safety, but it also affects their mental health. Women between 18 and 24 are most commonly abused by an intimate partner, and one in five women and one in 71 men in the U.S. have been raped in their lifetime. Half of those rape victims were raped by an acquaintance, and half of those women were raped by their intimate partner. I think that statistic is higher, but we won't know because things go unreported so often because there is such this negative stigma and cloud around being a victim of things, which is outrageous yes and when you're in a relationship and somebody doesn't listen when you say no just because you're in a relationship doesn't mean that it's not rape that's right you have the right to say no when you're in a relationship too i just want to point that out so ruth glenn of the national coalition against dv says that the barriers marie faced were not unique to nashville but are challenges that all dv victims face and this is a quote if they fall through the cracks or their needs aren't being addressed or something really bad happens, it's mostly because they're a domestic violence victim and our systems are not set up as properly as they could be to address the unique needs of every domestic violence victim. She also said in order to protect victims, there needs to be a coordinated response, but because they interact with so many different agencies, the safety net for DV has too many holes in it. And this is another quote. When they decide that something bad is going to happen, it's almost impossible to stop them. They will cut off a GPS. They will go put a false record to get a gun. They will sit in the dark for two hours. The list goes on and on. So basically what she's saying is once they decide that they're going to do something, you can't stop them most of the time, right? It can't be deterred. Yeah. So Alex would go on to help write four bills in Tennessee, and Alex is the brother of Marie. He would go on to help write four bills in Tennessee. Only one of those bills became law, but it requires more communication between the sheriff's office and the PD. Alex says it isn't enough, and this is a quote, for them, they view it as one thing that went wrong with their agency, but coupled together, there are like eight things that went wrong for this person that is dealing with the government Mm -hmm. to try and get the help they needed. Mm -hmm. So... I wanted to swing back around to the question I asked at the top of the episode, and Jess kind of went over it already, but I want to go over it again. Even sitting in dispatch, I hear from dispatchers, officers, and others, why didn't she leave? They ask the question like it has an easy answer. There is no easy answer when you are stuck in a domestic violence situation. I think it is important to know that victims don't fall in love with abusers. They fall in love with someone the abuser convinces them they are. They don't stay just because... They stay because they are afraid to leave, afraid for their lives, their children's lives, and everyone they love's lives, like she was in this situation, right? She was afraid that he would kill her. She was afraid he would kill her family. Some of them have no means to support themselves and no support systems in place, so they feel completely alone. Abusers will often cut their victims off from the support that they do have and isolate them. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the most dangerous time for a DV victim is when they decide to leave. One study found that men who killed their wives often did because she threatened to leave or actually left before the murder. Another study found that 20% of intimate partner homicide victims weren't the DV victims themselves, but were family members, friends, neighbors, people who tried to intervene, law enforcement, or bystanders, so people just trying to help. The victim knows how far their abuser will go, and sometimes they feel there is no safe escape. There's also this really good DV talk that a prosecutor by the name of Ryan Calvert does on YouTube. It's a TED Talk, and I'm going to share the link on our Facebook. He tells you to look at DV situations from the point of view of the victim, and he talks about how even as a prosecutor, he used to ask the same question, why doesn't she just leave, until one case changed his perspective. As dispatchers or just humans, we often will be tempted to ask the same question, Try to remember this the next time so-and-so calls for the second time because her husband's yelling at her. And just, you know, try to think about it before you start questioning. I think it's really important, too. If you are a friend of somebody in a domestic violence situation that they are aware of and they are trying to get out or they're trying to make changes, 
you don't have to help them. You don't have to fix it for them. But by all means, please don't abandon them. I was going to say that. Because a lot of times they'll just, they'll give up and they'll stay where they're at. Because Mm -hmm. it takes a lot to finally work up the courage. courage. So be there for them, whether it's a phone call or a text message or even just being there when they reach out. Be present for them because I, I guarantee you that you are one of the rocks that are that their pillar is built on. Yeah, I agree. I want to say from personal experience of the marriage that I was in, looking back now, I even sometimes catch myself being like, why didn't I leave? And then it comes, everything kind of comes back. And I remember how scary it was. I remember how I had kids that I couldn't take care of because I didn't have a job and he controlled the money, right? I remember Mm -hmm. him holding guns to my head or holding guns to his head and threatening to kill himself or threatening to kill my friends, threatening to kill anybody who spent time with me. And I did lose friends because I couldn't leave and they didn't understand that, right? It wasn't that I just Mm -hmm. wouldn't leave. It's just that I couldn't leave because I had all these people telling me, oh, divorce is bad, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's, it's not as bad as you dying and not being there for your kids, right? It's not as bad as what happened. I stayed in that situation and I will say I made calls, I called because he, when I did try to leave, he broke into my house and I had my mom on the phone and I called and made a report and he was not arrested because there wasn't enough evidence, right? So sometimes there's not enough quote unquote evidence to press charges against that person. And then that just made him more mad and that just made me more scared for my life. So I just want to like hug myself back then and be like, I understand why you didn't leave. Yeah. I'm proud that you finally worked up the courage. I'm sad that it got to the point that it did before you were able to cut yourself off from that person. I think there's a lot of people who are in our situation where they were dispatchers who were lucky enough to not have that as part of their lives, right? For me, because it was such a huge part of my life and because now I go and I speak about domestic violence and I kind of share my experience and the hopes that it'll help save a young mom. I get so frustrated when people are like, why didn't she just leave? I think it falls under the umbrella of blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. And I don't even mean that on a big scale of things, right? I mean it on on every scale, on the little things of like, oh, well, I had my purse stolen. It was in my car, but my car was unlocked. Oh, see, you shouldn't have left your car unlocked. (laughs) Like, that's still blaming the victim. Or... It's her fault because she was at a club drunk and wearing skimpy clothing. You're blaming the victim. I don't know why. I don't know if it stems down from the fact that the country does have the innocent until proven guilty, which is good, right? We want that because there are people that are accused of things that they have not done. So you want that safety net of innocent until proven guilty. But that innocent until proven guilty doesn't mean that the accuser is lying. Mm Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that something didn't happen. And this blaming the victim thing, it's so damaging to each and every victim, regardless of what you're victim of, Mm -hmm. that it's okay for us to be like, that person was the asshole. Hey, that person that opened a car that didn't belong to them, that took that person, went through it and took items that didn't belong to them, took your wallet with your money and your credit cards, they're the asshole. That's right. okay to say. We don't have to be like, well, you see, you shouldn't have done that. No, like that other person. Yeah, that other person shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So before I, I just, if if you take away, I hope you take away many things from this specific episode. But one of the things I hope you take away is just to have that cognitive thought in situations like this Mm -hmm. or any situation you have that cognitive thought of like is this really this person's fault yeah is it like it's okay to say that the person that beat their spouse is a fucking asshole that's not the spouse's fault for still being in the relationship it's the asshole's fault for beating them yes you gotta be kidding me like why is this something that people struggle with understanding i just well, and I think also in our in our job or 
you know, you used to be a dispatcher. But like, I think it happens so often too that we kind of become numb to it. Like we were saying last time, you kind of like make jokes or make light of situations and you kind of become numb because you have to in order to protect yourself, Mm -hmm. right? And you get Mm -hmm. frustrated maybe because you're tired of taking those DV calls or whatever. But like you said, stop blaming the victim and stop like... You know what else makes me mad? If we're going to go on to a rant about this is when people say that the victim is making themselves the victim. No. You know who made them the victim? Their abuser. And it doesn't make me less of a person because I was a victim of domestic violence. It doesn't make me an idiot. It doesn't make me the victim every time something comes up because I have PTSD. Do you know what I mean? It just, it's all frustrating. I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Whether you're a dispatcher or regardless of what your job is, I think just challenge your own perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what, and I'm not saying that people that blame the victims, when it's that knee jerk reaction, I'm not saying you're the bad guy in the situation, right? It's built into us that that's the automatic response we have. Yeah. Also, that's just a good thing to remember when you talk to anybody on a daily basis, like someone you see on a, in the supermarket, just be nice. Because you don't know what that person's yep. going through at home. Yeah. You don't you don't know their stories. Sorry. I, domestic violence makes me mad. <laughs> I think, yes, I 100% agree. So that's just my long, long talk at you. <laughs> this week's sources include the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and WSF News, as well as the CDC. If you or someone you know thinks they are in a domestic violence situation, please visit the Domestic Violence Support page or call 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. You can also text the word START to 8878. Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Truth Lies and Alibis.